Pleasure to be here, Chris. Um, Free, let's start by getting a sense from you of how you think of this thing that's happening now. You've covered so many disasters over the years. How do you rate and think of this one? Well, I think this is uh, more dramatic, more global, and more unusual than anything we, we have seen in a long, long time. Uh, because first you have the healthcare crisis, a pandemic that is spread across the world and with unknown lethality and unknown uh, consequences. And that is raging as we speak through the world. But then has come an economic uh, reality which has become more and more acute, which we were just hearing about. I think it's not right to call this a recession or even to talk about a, a, a Great Depression. This is sort of a great paralysis because for the first time that I can think of in recorded human history, you have had a literal standstill of the major economies of the world, large parts of the major economies of the world, which have literally just stopped functioning. The basic principle of economic exchange is not happening because human beings are not in proximity with one another and therefore cannot engage in that. So you are seeing a simple paralysis of that which is much deeper, I think, at least in the short term, than even the Great Depression. Then you get the result of what this does in poor countries, because so far we have just talked about what is happening in rich countries. Um, and now you get to the Indias of the world. And there you have the problems I described, except these countries are cash poor, uh, budget strained in budget terms, have poor healthcare systems, and have a, a, a lot of overcrowding. I mean, think about the slums of a place like Mumbai or Calcutta or Nairobi. Um, and then you add to this the geopolitics that is going to come to play as everybody draws in, as, as everybody becomes more nationalist. The, the most powerful expression of that is, of course, the European Union, which has been the celebration in the pooling of sovereignty. And what has happened in Europe is almost uh, all the countries in the so-called visa-free zone, the passport-free zone, the Schengen area, have reimposed borders for the first time in decades. And when Italy asked the European Union with fellow European members for help, uh, the 26 other countries to send them medical supplies and things, not one said yes. Do you have any picture in your mind about how you think this will play out? I mean, if it's a unique situation, a lot of people are hoping that it's a relatively short economic shock. We beat, defeat the virus. We somehow manage a careful return to work and um, life returns to normal. Is that fantasy thinking? I don't think it's fantasy thinking. A lot depends on uh, on how short that the, the shock is. And I do think there's some hopeful signs that we're seeing. We can get into that. The data has been very, very interesting and it's changing fast. Um, if it's short, I think you could see a return to some degree of normalcy. But I think it'll be very hard to just restart the economy because you know what, what, what you realize is that modern economies are like riding a bicycle on steroids. You know, the old line about riding a bicycle, you have to keep moving forward. Um, when you stop, it's not like you can just pick up where you were. Uh, think about a, a restaurant your credit lines uh, have collapsed. Your workers, uh, in many cases, have, uh, you know, may have lost their livelihood, may have gone back to the place they came from, may have found another job out of desperation. Uh, public's attitudes will not be exactly the same, particularly for close contact uh, uh, businesses like restaurants. Um, and so, you know, because you've had a disruption of supply and demand at the same time, uh, it's not going to be that easy to restart. And that is why the government is correctly uh, getting very involved. And I have to say on this front, the American government seems to be doing more uh, than most other governments. There are a lot of areas where you can say the American government has been, has been, has performed uh, abysmally. But on the economic front, with all the partisanship in, in Washington, it is actually properly, and the Federal Reserve as a part of that, is properly reacting to the kind of historic nature of this. So I think if it's a short shock, we might get back to, to some degree of normal, though there will be industries like travel and restaurants and theaters, uh, maybe sports, that will have a much longer time time frame. If we get a vaccine, when we get a vaccine, 
I tend to, on that front, be a little bit more historically minded by this. You know, if the Spanish flu that killed multiple, multiple, multiple times as many people uh, in percentage terms as uh, as this one will likely, uh, if that didn't kill restaurants and theaters and uh, and and, and uh, sports. I'm not sure this will. I, I think we should, we, we, the people are painting a picture of a world where there will never be restaurants and there will never be movie theaters and there will never be, uh, you know, gatherings of any kind. I don't know. Human beings like to be in contact with one another. Well, there, I'm sure that the last um, pandemic in the Spanish flu killed many businesses and uh, eventually they came back indifferent. So it's, 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 it's almost hard to separate. I mean, what's clear is there's going to be just massive amounts of tragedy, massive numbers of people who may have seen their life savings evaporate um, if they even ever had any or maybe struggling on the breadline right, right now. And um, uh, and yes, some kind of life will be come back. We uh, let's 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 talk. Let, a bit let about me just say yeah. let me just say one thing. One thing about what you said, uh, Chris, because it's so important. I think so many of the people who are who we deal with uh, live in a digital economy, in which they can work from home. Their jobs, in large part, can continue in some way or the other. Okay, you, maybe you lose some business, but um, you know there is a much greater degree of stability. But for the vast majority of people who are losing their jobs, they're losing their jobs because they, they, their work can't be digitized. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to recognize this is creating its own kind of new inequality, an equality between the digital economy and the, and the, and the material economy, between knowledge workers and non-knowledge workers, which maps on rather you know, tragically in similar ways to the old inequalities. Um, in which people with, again, with, who were knowledge workers did well and people who were working with their hands did not. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And it's, it's um, it, I mean, the only thing, only piece of hope I can see from that is that so many people have developed this newfound appreciation for the amazingness of the work of people they didn't spend enough time thinking about. Um, you You see you know, people talking with great gratitude about their delivery man or the woman who, who you know, the, for their once a week visit to the grocery store, if they could manage that or, and so forth. And these people are, are heroes as are workers on the front line. The question is, is almost like, is there any chance, do you see any chance that that kind of attitude will survive this, that will hold on to that and somehow reframe the um, the priorities in our economy, the people who we think should be compensated more perhaps, um, and just how we all think of each other is much more interconnected than we know, or do we just forget about this after a month of things kind of going back to normal? I hope we do, and I think some of that depends on people like you and me, uh, you know, who do have a role in shaping uh, public dialogue and public memory, not to make sure that it, it doesn't get forgotten. Um, and that we do remember that, you know, we're all in this together. Um, you know, I often think about that when, you, when you're dealing with people in uh, countries like the United States who are poor, who don't vote, who don't write op-eds. You know, how do you make sure that that perspective and that voice is, is remembered? The, unfortunately, the structural reality is that, you know, the, the, the digital economy will do even better out of this recovery because people will learn that they can you know, buy groceries online when they might have not, you know, wanted to do that beforehand. And the, the little mom and pop store um, on the street corner might might lose more business as a result of it. So it's, it's all the more reason to try to remind people uh, that we're all in this together. So right now, every country on the planet has this horrible dilemma as to how aggressively you shut things down um, and and then how, if at all, how to bring things back. Give us your sense, Farid, on which countries have done a good job of managing that dilemma and, uh, and, and which really haven't so far. I think it's actually pretty easy to, to tell uh, right now. The data is that we have enough information that we can say that quite definitively. Um, you know, obviously there may be second waves and third waves, but so far. Uh, it is not the case that dictatorships have done this better than democracies. That is not the dividing line. The dividing line is places that have effective government that have depended on uh, experts and acted early. 
so that the key the key countries that have done well have been the ones in East Asia, um, and that's uh, China, which actually comes across uh, in many ways uh, worse than some of the others, but because it was a very slow start, it hid the data, it lied about it, but then when it got fi finally realized it was serious, they they handled it very well. But the countries that really come across well are uh, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong. And what they did, and South Korea is really probably the model country, is they acted very early. They uh, developed their own tests the minute the, uh, the DNA was, uh, sequence was published. Uh, and then they went out and did mass testing, mass testing and contact tracing, because the most important thing you need to understand is how many people have this disease. Um, so that you can understand what, what parts of the economy, what, whom to isolate, whom not to isolate, things like that. So, you know, because without that, you're really flying blind. And what South Korea was able to do was really do the, the most sophisticated kind of testing, which is random sampling. So, you know, because we, what we're doing, just think about how we are uh, arriving at something like our fatality rate, how many people die. We only know the people who test for COVID on the basis of people who fall sick, are sick enough that they go to a hospital or a clinic, and the hospital or clinic says, okay, your symptoms are close enough to what we think uh, COVID is, and we'll, we'll, we'll test you for it. And those are the people we test. South Korea, which of course means there are lots of people, we now know lots of people who have mild symptoms, who get over it, who think it's a cold, all those people don't get counted. The South Koreans did all of that. They have achieved the most, in some ways, the most impressive results uh, in, in the world without a national lockdown, without shelter in place, without quarantines. They have occasionally selectively done it for a specific, you know, with, with a bar, bars in one area or things like that. But that's really, I think the world should look at that example because they have achieved it without shutting down the economy. It's almost like the, the, the watchword for a future pandemic is, can you, avoid it getting out of control. And only a few countries have done that when, when you can still be in this containment mode of basically being able to track every known case. That is completely different from the mode of it's out of control, we can't possibly track down everyone, so we just have to shut everything down. And that's when the massive economic damage and so forth kicks in. Um, yeah, it, how would you, it, it how would almost, you, uh, yeah. it, it almost uh, uh, in some ways, this crisis, uh, plays to America's weaknesses rather than to its strengths. Uh, the United States has many strengths, uh, but it is a chaotic, disorganized, messy, noisy country, right? Uh, and it's slow to stir to action, but once it stirs to action, you know, over time it accomplishes a lot. This is the sort of, this is Churchill's famous line about the United States is you can count on the United States to do the right thing after it has exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> so what this, you know, unfortunately for exactly the reason you say, this is a crisis where early action helps enormously, you know, because of, because of the nature of exponential growth, if you catch it early, it makes a big difference. Unfortunately, the United States did not do that. Are there any countries in Europe? I mean, many countries in Europe also, um, kind of botched what, what happened, certainly when you compare with that, what happened in some Asian countries. Are there any that impressed you? Yes, Germany is, uh, uh, G uh, Germany is actually close to South Korea in how well it has handled. It started a little bit later, um, has, all, has put in place uh, shelter and uh, you know, stay-at-home stay policies and social distancing, um, partly because I think it, it got a slightly slower start. Um, Denmark has done very well as doing uh, random testing, and as a result, you're seeing the Danes are beginning to open up the economy. Um, I think that uh, Iceland is doing is doing well again, trying to do the test. You know, what you notice about all these uh, places where the government is respected, it's well funded, the bureaucracies get good people. Uh, those people are able to exercise a lot of you know power and and, and uh, discretion. Hmm. Whitney. 
So um, we're seeing a, a lot of questions online, hi there, Fareed, uh, about uh, the negative impacts on um, the economy and our lifestyle, which are things that we've been hearing often. But can you speak to some of the, the positive things you see coming out of this as it relates to work opportunities, our economy, the lifestyle, the way that we have been doing things? Uh, what do you see as positive outcomes of, of this disruption? Well, let's let's not minimize the negative because I think there are probably a lot of people there who are feeling pain uh, and who are experiencing massive dislocations in their lives. And I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, it's important for the government to help to treat this as a kind of disaster relief program, not as a traditional stimulus. You know, this is a case where, frankly, the government forced these businesses for understandable reasons, but forced these businesses not to operate or force these people not to go to work. And it is incumbent on the government to provide assistance. Now, wh what are the opportunities? Unfortunately, they're mostly in the digital realm, right? I mean, you're going to, you're going to see a lot, you know, people are finding ways to be able to do things digitally that they didn't, uh, you know, where they were previously doing it in other ways. Uh, uh, me meetings, you know, everything can be done. You, you're, you're going to find ways to be more productive uh, than you had to do. Uh, look, I mean, one, one piece of this I think about is maybe we all travel too much. Maybe there are ways to achieve, to do a lot of meetings without having to do the con, you know, so, so many of us go uh, travel a lot. It's probably bad for the environment. It's um, not great for your, uh, for your family life. Um, and so maybe there is a kind of an ability to, to step back and say, you know, that we could have a different kind of life. Um, we could have, a, we could achieve a certain amount uh, in other ways, uh, but I but I do want to stress, you know, this is this is very tough on a lot of people, and it's and unfortunately, I think the part we are going to find um, more difficult than people are imagining is that restart button. Um, you you you're not going to just push a button and get the economy going again. Farid, do you think that the Indian government got it right um, in in what they did? Because the dilemma for them is different from elsewhere, you've got the virus coming, but you also have your economy is powered by people who are, who make no money. And, um, and, and as, as we heard earlier, the potential hardship that some of them face, is, is this a case where the cure literally might be worse than the disease? You know, it's a very tough question and it's a very tough challenge. I would have hate, hated to have been in Prime Minister Modi's shoes. Um, Clearly, what was animating that decision was this. Um, India was at an early enough stage that if you acted quickly, again, because of this exponential growth, you could achieve something uh, significant. And most importantly, India has one of the lowest beds per capita uh, in the world. You know, it has a, it has a very two-tiered uh, healthcare system for the rich. It's, it's world-class. But particularly in rural India, it's, it's really quite inadequate. And so there was an under, they knew that if this got out of control, it was going to crash the healthcare system in a very big way. So they made the decision they did. As often with Prime Minister Modi, he takes decisions, but then takes them, you know, there's a kind of weird impulsiveness. Um, so he gave the country, you know, 1.4 billion people four hours from 8 p.m. to midnight to prepare. And this is a country in which you have 50 to 60 million migrant workers who are working in cities but live hours and hours away. Uh, this is a, a country in which, as you say, most businesses conducted face to face. It seems like you could have done, uh, you could have given people, I would have said, you know, give them five days or three days to prepare for this. But at the end of the day, I think I understand the, the, the decision Prime Minister Modi made. Uh, it is an attempt to say, look, we're going to suppress this as much as we can. Um, keep the numbers very low, and then when we open up, we have the opportunity to do some of this testing and tracing. I hope they're using these three weeks to really ramp up mass testing, because if you're not, you know, this is what the United States did with the, we put the ban on China, which was the right thing to do, ban on travel from China, but then we didn't take advantage of those three weeks to do anything. What's your diagnosis of, of why the U.S. didn't do that? Um, it's easy to blame Trump, and clearly this played to Trump's weaknesses. He doesn't believe in experts, he doesn't believe in science, 
uh, he, he's impulsive. All, all he cares about is the stock market. And he worried that this would in some way interfere with it, with its rise. He doesn't like bad news. He pushes it away. But, you know, it's worth noting that even uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci gave interviews in which he said this is not really likely to be a concern for the United States. So I think the way I would describe it is I think what happened is initially people looked at what happened in China and they thought because of what the Chinese had done, it would stay contained in China with a little bit of uh, leakage. What they didn't realize was maybe that the Chinese had allowed international, more international travel, or they had locked down on domestic travel. Um, and so they were sort of underreacting a little bit to what, what was the real nature of the problem. When it then came to Italy, Italy was the, the, the pivotal moment, I think, when it explodes in Italy. And that's when everyone starts panicking. And you could even argue that maybe there was a slight overreaction. And that's why you started seeing models that said two to three million people would die because people started using the Italian data, which I think is very, it's very complicated because uh, Italians are the your second oldest population in the world, very high incidence of smoking, very close intermingling, inter intergenerational living. Um, and it may not be representative, but, but I think that's what happened. Fareed, talk about just the, the partisan divide in so many countries and how you see this virus Im impacting that. I mean, you yourself, you know, you work from CNN, it's regarded on the right as, as hopelessly uh, liberal. You've been criticized by people on the right. You just criticized Trump r r right now. And so you, you're, you're right in the middle of this constant firestorm of, of, um, of you know, partisan battering. Um, is there, and yet you, you also spoke about some key things that um, the administration may have got right here in terms of, or at least in partnership with Congress, got right in terms of the, the stimulus. It's actually been greater than in other countries. Do, do you see, coming away from the actual policy bit for a minute, but just us talking with each other, talking with people around the country and around the world, is there any way that this moment somehow reduces the partisan divide or is actually just ramping it up to ever more intense levels of like the people who are disgusted by Trump and what he's done are probably more disgusted and angry now than they have ever been. And maybe the people who are disgusted at the people who are disgusted at Trump feel more strongly than ever. Is there, is there, is there any end to this or are we just in for, I don't know, in the US, for example, the bloodiest election of all time and, and, and just an impossibly painful aftermath. Can there be any kind of path to both national unity and then, you know, international connection out of this? I'm asking on behalf of a friend, many friends. You know, uh, I wish I could give you uh, much solace, but it's been striking, hasn't it? That if you go, if you look at this last month and a half, what is most striking is how, how little Donald Trump's approval ratings have moved. So if you look at, you know, other periods in these kind of national crises, what tends to happen is the president's approval ratings go way up. Um, you know, George H.W. Bush after the fall of the Berlin Wall, George W. Bush after 9-11, even Jimmy Carter, the first months of the hostage crisis, when the Iranians took American hostages, his numbers went up because there's a rally around the flag. It did happen for Trump for something like 10 days. Um, and he's now back to approval ratings, which are roughly the same as where they were before. So in other words, uh, what is striking about uh, Donald Trump's approval ratings as a symbol for the partisan divide is how little they have moved one way or the other. So it's that his supporters support him no matter what. It's his opponents dislike him no matter what. Uh, and you're right, it's very hard to, um, to bridge those divides. Look, I try very hard to approach things from an analytic rather than a kind of polemical or partisan perspective. So as you say, when the administration does something right, I try to give them credit for it. I, I, I will point out, I get pilloried on both sides, by the way. The, the right doesn't, you know, doesn't accept the... Uh, the, you know, the, the credit and the left accuses me of being a traitor. But my view is, I'm, you know, I'm a journalist. I, I'm trying to be uh, uh, not objective. No one is objective, but I'm trying to be analytic. And that's my job. So, for example, I'll give you one example. I've been looking a lot at the testing data. 
And it does appear that we have very bad data, that we really need to get much better testing data, and that the initial um, uh, new data that we are getting, that, that on the basis of the more, the more and more data we're getting, it is, does look like the fatality rates are much lower than we thought. In other words, that this disease might not be as fatal. And what I find is when I talk to people, everyone's trying to figure out in their heads, does that mean that, is this good for Trump? Is this bad for Trump? Is this what, you know, where should I position myself on this? And my feeling is this is just a, you know, a factual matter. And more importantly, we need to have the best data. We need to know what the actual fatality rate is, whatever the you know, mistakes people made in the past, whatever the models did. But it's very difficult to even take something like data and completely unhinge it from the partisan context in which everything is now viewed. And that mm -hmm. is part of a much larger discussion about how we have entered a realm of really a tribal identity politics, where our, our, our political views reflect uh, so, something very deep about our identity and therefore very hard to change. They reflect who we are socioeconomically, they reflect who we are culturally, they reflect who we are in terms of our friend circle, where we live. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, mere data is not going to change that. Do you take any solace from the fact that um, scientists are gaining in credibility and is it possible to imagine that in the in the coming years that people will actually pay more attention when scientists tell us that there's something big and bad coming and we ought to pay attention to it? I would hope so. I mean, I hope it makes us realize that in general, we all, you know, I remember Michael Gove, the British uh, minister, one of Boris Johnson's uh, associates saying during the Brexit campaign, the British public has had enough with experts. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, well, when Michael Gove gets ill, I'm assuming he goes to a doctor. He doesn't consult, you know, uh, uh, you know, some guru or some or, or some uh, something like that. He goes to somebody who's trained and has expertise in the field and knows how to evaluate data. Um, and I think what we're realizing here is in that situations like this, with all the caveats and with all the complications, you need experts. You need to rely on them. And as you say, Chris, I, what I hope is that it develop. We we get, get we have a slight, you know, that it translates. That if you believe the science and you and you trust the scientists and you think the data uh, is getting better on this issue, well, maybe when they talk about climate change, we should also be keeping in mind that the same thing is true. And again, that the, the the data has been proving and reproving and confirming what they've been saying for twenty years now. Indeed, let's wrap up with uh, another question or two from from Whitney and our online audience. Sure, the, the audience is very interested in what you're um, sharing here, Fareed. And there's one question that's really um, simple, which is just how do you see um, this changing? Whitney, I can't hear you. I, I don't know if that's... Oh. Um, oh. I, let me... I should keep going, Whitney, because I can hear you and I, I will be the translator here. That's mm -hmm. strange. That, that sounds perfect, a little workaround. Um, yeah, the question is just simply, how do you see this changing the balance of power globally? So the question was, how do you see this changing the balance of power globally? Um, I think, again, it's so much depends on how short uh, this this process is and what it does. But I'll tell you one of the first things that I've been seeing when I've talked to people around the world, when you read uh, newspaper accounts of what is happening, uh, everyone has been stunned at the degree of chaos in the United States and the degree, uh, you know, the degree to which the healthcare system uh, has proven to be inadequate. We don't even know how many beds we have. We don't know how many ventilators we have. Um, and that is, I think it's a serious blow to America's image because uh, people would, would think that the United States might not be, um, you know, the most beneficent power. It may not, you know, it may do uh, things that they would regard as crazy, like invade Iraq. But they always thought the American economy was the best. The American technology was the best. And so most people assumed American healthcare would be would be great. I think what they saw was the crazy quilt patchwork of the American healthcare system, with federal, state, local authorities competing. Uh, you know, people don't even have the right data. So that piece of American soft power, if you will, the Amer the example of American power, has taken a a, a, a beating. Um, the second and perhaps more important issue is that it's not so much what it does to American power; it's what it does to the idea of common interests and, and common um, 
objectives and common uh, common policies. Um, so what has happened, as I mentioned, is everyone has retreated and is pursuing things from their narrow self-interest, uh, whether it's the Italians, the Germans, uh, the Chinese, the South Koreans, and of course, the Americans. It is the biggest, the, the greatest damage to the system is done by the Americans because we have traditionally been the world's leaders, the organizers and things like that. Um, so, but everywhere you are seeing a fraying of that international order, a fraying of that sense of cooperation, uh, a fraying of the idea that there are common objectives. The scientists, to be in, to be give them credit, are working together. The scientists have been sharing information. American scientists, Chinese scientists, and you hear this everywhere. European scientists. Uh, if only the politicians could mirror the scientists. To me, this the, there's a kind of tragic irony here, which is, this is a global, this is a classically global challenge, right? We are all in it together. We face a common foe and we face, and this is almost biblical in its nature. We, you know, this is, this would be the time to unite because this is a virus that does not discriminate on the basis of national boundaries, on the basis of skin color, on the basis of wealth. Um, we're all in it together. And therefore, if we pool our resources and we would try to get a vaccine, try to get a cure, try to time the openings and closings, the quarantines, the reopenings of travel, all that would have happened much more effectively. It would be a win-win-win um, if we could see that this is a global challenge and therefore it, would, it, would, uh, it, it uh, necessitates a great global response. But at that, the same time, because of the nature of this challenge, because it involves uh, our health, our security perhaps, we've become very narrow-minded and, and, and drawn in. I'm hoping mm. that after the initial shock goes away, people will realize that, uh, you know, there, there really are such enormous benefits here to cooperating, to doing this together, uh, to working with other countries. Uh, and that at the end of the day, what we're all looking for is health, safety, security. Um, so, you know, I'm an optimist. So I do hope that at some point it reawakens this sense that, you know, um, I mean, think about the United States. We spend $700 billion on defense every year. And we don't have enough face masks for our healthcare workers. Yeah. We don't have enough ventilators for our critically ill. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere in there, we have got to rethink our priorities. Well, indeed. In some ways, it's very simple. It's about math. It's about science. Um, it's about a common enemy. When you have a common enemy, you kind of have to unite against it. And I, I still, the optimist in me is holding on to that possibility as well, that eventually we'll, we'll come around to that. Fareed, thank you so much for the work you're doing, for spending this time here now. I do think the world needs more analytical journalists. Um, Whitney, you got anything else to, as we wrap up here? No, I think uh, if you can hear me now, um, the, the audience has been just uh, very, they're responding very positively and really receptive to what you've been saying. So thank you so much, Fareed, for, for joining us today. Thank you both. It really is my pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Fareed. Take care.